And again, this gets into Martin Armstrong's confidence in government. The confidence is collapsing in governments, which means interest rates are going to rise to attract buyers. Yeah, well, let me throw in here, Egon von Greerts, what a fantastic resource on the show like yourself for some time. He claims we've now entered the exponential um, phase of this run higher in the precious metals. I think we're seeing some signs of that in gold. Um, we haven't quite seen it yet in silver, but, you know, we do expect gold to run first. You know, it took almost a year for of new highs in gold before silver went bananas and you think we're gonna it's gonna take it's gonna happen much faster this time i guess i think that the, it can i, I yeah. don't know again i'm saying we're on thin ice meaning i don't know if they want to take this side oh, look can the money masters consolidate this and whipsaw everybody for another two years of course they can of course they can but we're, we're time is not on their side okay so from a cycles basis point and that's what armstrong and Ninner are getting into at some point this is gonna we're gonna get a bullish move everybody's gonna yawn at it they're gonna treat it like oh we've seen this before it's just another fake out and they're just going to be in awe as it doesn't stop and it runs okay that's the danger when you get up to the 30 dollar level on silver and especially if you start seeing closes up there is um, this geopolitically and where the government is at and where the election cycle is at, we are not in 2011, which is the last time silver was making its run towards 50. This world is completely different. Um, and I agree. No, that's interesting. Now let's investigate that because I typically like when it comes to gold and silver, they're just, I don't know, you know, I don't want to say boring markets. Compared to the cryptos, they're pretty slow. You know what I mean? I mean, in, in, or NVIDIA or something. I mean, they've been kind of dull and lackluster for quite some time. If what you're saying is true, and we're on the cusp of something really big, I mean, it's not going to matter much, you know, how much gold and silver you, you hold. I mean, you seem to think like we're talking about a sea change event. A, I don't know, uh, do I whisper the, the nuclear well, we're headed towards that. Um, yeah. I mean, we're definitely headed towards that. I mean, we're going to see that before the decade's out. Um, but um, I, I would... For guys, for guys that are, have extreme allocation into silver and gold, they can take what we're saying and talking about pullbacks, and they can get cute. And I mean that respectfully. They can get cute yeah. and buy orders and limit orders down below and retraces and all that kind of stuff that the traders are going to do. Yeah. But I think to your point, to, to new listeners or to listeners that have come on that are, you know, maybe they got uh, three grand in silver, but if they got it from their grandma and they've never really actually invested and they've got, you know, a couple hundred grand in a 401k, it's time. Um, and my whole attitude has been on silver is you don't invest in silver to get rich. You invest in silver because that is fire insurance on, on your life. Because it, it, there is coming a day when it does go vertical and it doesn't look back. And I do think that when we go vertical to 30 to 50, it's going to be fast. And I think 50 to 100 will be, when, yeah. will be days. It'll be days. Well, hey, hey, listen, all that is music to the ears of everyone listening, right? But, you know, I think we can also take another perspective on it, can't we? I mean, bottom line, silver's a bargain. Now, admittedly, $28 silver doesn't look quite as tasty as $22 or $23 silver. But I think and when we look back in the rearview mirror, you know, at $28 silver, when it's pushing $128, you know, on its way to maybe $228 and much higher, I mean, it's it's like arguing... Over Bitcoin at eighteen thousand or twenty eight, does it matter where you bought it? You know, when it's on, yeah. it's on its way to uh, clearly over the next several years to a quarter million. I don't, I, don't where, chart, yeah. I don't have the chart in front of me, but the gold silver ratio. I mean, I don't even know what it's standing at right now. But the last time I looked at it, it was ridiculous. I mean, it's just yeah. ridiculous. Oh yeah, I mean, oh. one gold coin purchases you how many sil silver gold ounces? Yeah. I mean, come on. It's, yeah. it's a, it's a fire sale. And, you know, I just hope that's why we've been begging people, Aaron, for like four years, whatever you do, 
they're they're giving it away. You can take one gold coin and buy like a Roman centurion's lifetime savings. You know what I mean? Or or, or a Roman senator from well, two thousand years ago, Pontius Pilate. You know everything he had in the bank with one gold coin. That's how much silver you can purchase. And I would argue that silver is going to outperform gold because, and I can't prove this, but I it makes sense. I don't believe any numbers coming out about central bank gold holdings in countries. I mean, if if you don't believe the unemployment numbers, do not believe the tick data about treasury holdings overseas as well as gold holdings. There's no way that I don't believe the Chinese, the Russian. I, I don't believe our number. I don't believe those numbers. Um, I believe that there's far more gold being held and silver gets destroyed in the industrial process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's way more gold than they're telling everybody and silver by its, because of its use case is constantly being destroyed. So to me, silver is going to outperform gold. You can look at a gold silver ratio and historically where that should be to figure out it's going to outperform. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm a big fan of silver at this point. Um, and they are, they're good relatively compared to where it's going. They're giving it away. I like the sound of that giving it away. And you know, you are right. I mean, people forget that in the industrial process, we lose so much of our silver, um, just in the production of what a keyboard, a computer keyboard. I'm talking a cell phone. I'm talking name any electronic device, maybe a solar panel. I've heard some people say as much as an ounce into a 100, 200, 300 watt solar panel. It's gone forever. It's included in solders and things like that. And it's discard. Yeah. And it's huge. It's huge in solar electric, which they're trying to get everybody to. It's that's a huge component. Um, and I don't have the latest numbers. I know the cruise missiles 10 years ago, so I don't know. They might have fixed it, but the, ten, the cruise missiles 10 years ago required 30 pounds of silver per cruise missile. Wow. Come on. Really? Yeah. yeah you, can, you can check that out. Yeah. You can actually verify it because I'm not going to try it here. online. Uh, yeah, it, I mean... uh, it was it, I, it, I was in awe of how much silver was required. Well, you know, I can corroborate your, your thought there. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but the U.S. military had a three billion ounce silver stockpile for decades. And unfortunately, most of it was used to build the cyclotrons, OK, at um, the Oak Ridge facilities, as well as the other cyclotrons, I think, on the Pacific Northwest and then probably again in the Manhattan Project in the Southwest. So in two or three places in the United States, that silver that silver was consumed. Okay, it's never been from to my knowledge ever been replenished. So I just googled this. How much silver in a cruise missile? Okay. 500 ounces. Wow. 16 ounces a pound and yes, I know it's different for metal. 16 ounces a pound that's 31.25 pounds of silver. And and what happens to it when it explodes? Yeah, I don't think they're it, it, it vaporizes. I don't think they're recycling that. <clears throat> that's going to be that's going to take a lot of AIs and robots. I think a couple hundred years to recycle that. Yeah. So needless to say in the in the new electrics and the new uh the new economy, the new digital economy, silver is a major component i think it's only going to increase as as we get towards uh greater inventions you know on, along uh, alternative uh, electrical use cases we'll put it that way right um so that's kind of that's kind of where i stand on silver today I, i'm hoping for a pullback next week i hope it's pretty bloody <laughs> because <laughs> consider that a gift from god um but where we're going geopolitically i'm i'm I don't think we get it. I'll be I'll be on your program and I could be wrong a year from now, but I don't think we get out of this year alive. Wow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, let's investigate that. But what as we do is um, I don't know if we can put rose colored glasses on. You don't none of us get out of life alive. But what from what you're saying, um, something you, you're seeing something on the horizon. Let's talk about that. Crude oil. 
Does it agree with you? Let's see. Crude oil starting to agree with you. It's perking up too. Ford, the Ford curve is a business. Crude oil is, if, uh, well, let me go pull up my, uh, if you if if the silver looks bad, and I mean bad in a good way, in a good way, um, crude. Let's let me pull up crude. Crude uh, is um, less savory, but still perking up. The one big problem I see here is the forward curve is a mess on crude. But I understand there's different dynamics at play in this. It's, it's a very complex market. You see the chart up on the screen? Did I not? Oh, I didn't see that chart. Okay, let me pop that up there if we haven't. Oh, my bad. Here, let me pop this up for you. Three, two, one. I stopped sharing. How dare I? Yeah, so you can see it. You've got the same chart I've got. You, you've got a uh, a monthly break over the trend line. Right, exactly. I, it, you can, I thank Alex Gomez for that. He he taught me stay away from the uh, candle wicks and go directly to the candle sticks. Yeah, the bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I would. I'm still on the fence, and this gets me in trouble because David Haggath is wildly bullish on oil and good for him he's been right i've been wrong um i am on the fence until we take out this high and more importantly i think about 94 95 right in here 95 and we're off to the races but the forward curve has got me on the fence right now and we'll just have to see but if you're right and the world is about, yeah, go ahead. I, I agree. Well, I agree with you. I mean, I think you've got solid resistance at 92 to 95 for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you get above that and I'll, I mean, we'll, we'll head to uh, 124 is my next. Exactly. Resistance. No, I'm with you. I mean, as soon as we break out, there's no, there's nothing to stop us. The only thing though, is if I'm looking at, uh, I mean, heck weeklies are on buys. The only thing that hasn't gone full buys yet, MACD's, MACD monthlies are not on buys yet, but they're curling. They're they won't take much to get them. So yeah. you've got so you've got uh, you've got risk in the oil market, the equity market. That's a whole other conversation. The equity market. Um, yeah, rolled over a little. Let's take a peek. We've been waiting how many months for this to finally happen? See, do, 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 do. I'll pop that up there. S and P. Finally, a monthly bear candlestick. Yeah, I'm not happy about the uh, equity market. Not uh, happy. I, not I thought you were quite bearish. I, I, I thought this would, you'd be thrilled by this. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, you know, uh, yeah, no, I'm. Um, I, I, I want one final rally in the equity market, and I'm not sure I'm going to get it. But I'd like to get one more rally in the equity market, and uh, then I think uh, I think the equity market is uh, beyond beyond screwed this year. Mm, uh, that it, bad. It, it's going to be bad. It, it, I'm looking oh. at uh, I'm looking at analogs of 1929 and 1893, um, and uh, I think well, I I don't think we make it to the fall, and then I think the fall is even worse. Good um, Lord. Steve, and, and, Steve. and that, I, I have, let me just say, that takes some guts, considering we just hit an all new epic high. I mean, yeah. look, at, look at this beautiful thing. You, you really, you, you would, you would, how dare you? I could just hear I'm the not, bulls, right? the bulls out there. Now, by the way, I don't have an iron in this fire, Aaron. I don't think I could rub two equities together. You know what I mean? I, I'm just weary of the whole thing. So I, I'm not really rooting for or against it, but, you know, I get nervous selling new highs. In my experience, selling new highs is just where you, you know what I mean? You run into trouble, man. Yeah, I, 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 I totally hear you. I totally hear you. Um, yeah, it's not for the faint of heart. I, no. I totally get that. I think what, what, what I'm saying on this program is that 
2024, in my opinion, is a sea change. It's a sea change okay. in minerals. It's a sea change in commodities in, in general. So mm -hmm. being part of that, I think it's a sea change in equities. Um, and um, there's, there's going to be a lot of volatility in all those instruments, um, and, and especially going into the fall. So I think I think I think right now what you're seeing is the setup for the equities. You're seeing right now the setup for oil breaking out. You're seeing the setup for the metals, uh, especially silver breaking out. That's just the setup for what's coming later this fall um, to a host of uh, investable assets. Yeah, yeah. And okay. don't get me started. And then don't get get me started on housing. Because if uh, if I'm right, or if, if the smarter guys in the room are right about uh, where the yields are going, interest rates are going, you can say goodnight to the to real Case estate. Shiller. Let's take a look at Case Shiller, just because that's concerning to me. We've uh, housing is really big in this area, and I don't want my brothers-in-law to be facing a a down market. Oh Lord! So you think we could have a double top here in the Case Shiller? Yeah, I, th I definitely think housing is, I mean, I don't have the stuff in front of me about that, how much housing has already dropped um, when look looking at a number of different metrics besides Case Schiller, but uh, the speed at which it's dropping is, is what's scaring some technicians. Um, and again, it makes sense. Look, if yields, you know, we've got a whole generation of home buyers that aren't used to where the yields are. Mm. And, if the yields, and, it, and if the yields... I mean, you got to go back to, you know, you got to go talk to your dad and go back to the early 1970s in, in buying a house versus <laughs> by 79. I mean, and what the interest rates were doing and what a mortgage looked like. Um, and nobody had any idea starting the 70s that that's what they were looking at, nor did they when they were looking at the prices of gold and silver in 70, 71, 72, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if you had told them where it was going to be in 79, 80, they, they would have laughed at you, but they weren't laughing when they got there. Um, so I, I think that that's, I, I just think that we're looking at a historic sea change in a number of assets and um, it's going to, you're going to need to be very adept. You're going to need to be um, passive investing is going to get you killed. Mm. Well, let's take a look at this for a moment. All right. We're looking at Case Schiller. This is a monthly chart. We topped right 2006. I remember like it was yesterday. Bernanke came on the show the morning. Me and wonderful Bob Chapman, who sadly passed, uh, announced we were expecting a crash in housing. Bernanke came on. I think it was with Maria, lovely Maria Bartiramo. Oh, and yeah. She, yeah and, and he said, I've never heard of such a thing. Housing prices never go down. I'll never forget it. We said, we laughed and we were like, no, this thing is going to implode. We, we had no idea. It was going to completely implode. Over the next two or three years, it just was gutted, as you can see on the chart right here, mm -hmm. to about 2011, 2012, put in a nice bottom. You think we're facing something similar? Now, we don't have the Altes, we don't, do we? We don't have the Ninja loans. We don't have the toxic debt that we had quite back then. What do you think is the catalyst? Is it the commercial sector that's teetering right here? Well, the commercial is already. I mean, the commercial yeah. is commercial for a number of societal reasons um, is coming down. You're, you're, you're seeing, I mean, you're already seeing them, you know, some of the guys that have bought the commercial real estate, handing back the keys, walking away. And I'm talking institu at the institutional level. Right. Um. And I think it's I think it's a function of a number of societal trends we don't have to get into. But I, oh, but, but let's do let, let me ask you one other quick question. Do you think these massive hedge funds that bought up literally like not just neighborhoods, but I'm talking like counties? Right. Of ha yeah. You know where I'm headed with this. Yeah. Um, yeah. The kind of Blackstone. You know what I mean? The big, big boys came in and bought up like half of Southern California. And I'm sorry, uh, Southern Florida. You know, when prices were, they were just fire sale. You could, you could fog a mirror. You could walk away with a property. Okay. From what I understand, they bought it by the millions of yeah. properties. 
Do you think they might start unwinding if the risk of rates go? Because think about it. If they borrowed on margin, even if they got bargains, and there's even a hint of a housing downturn, they're going to want to dump as much of that as possible, aren't they? That inventory? Well, I think, I think uh, and I'm not adept. I've heard a number of guys that are within the commercial real estate and within packaging the loans for them understand that they can dump it or hand the keys back and they still continue on. They're not losing ah, capital. Okay. So they okay. can dump it. And if they see that this thing is headed south, they can dump it, stick it back to the loan companies and then come back in and buy pennies on the dollar all over again at the bottom. Mm. So, why, so why wouldn't they? Um, and I do think it's a function, a lot of it of, of higher interest rates. Um, and you're not going to get that if you're, uh, I mean, I mean, you're not, you're not going to get that if you're just a, a regular investor. Mm. Okay. Mm. I mean, it's, it's going to hurt. Meaning if you, if, if, if rates are going not eight, nine, 10, 11, 12%, who's moving, who's buying. I mean, who's really going to buy. So, so it's almost like, you know, if, if you bought a house, you're stuck with it. You're not, you're not, you're not relocating because the cost, maybe you, maybe you bought that house at 2%, right? On a loan. Now, what are you going to do? You're not getting a 2% loan on a mortgage. So you're stuck wherever you're at. And look at this trend. I mean, we're talking since, oh my gosh. I mean, you do realize it's conceivable. We just reversed. <sighs> I just said this a 40 year. Whoa, 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 whoa. Look at, I haven't even taken a, a peek at this. Yeah. This is stunning. Hang on, hang on. I mean, even if we give it a little leeway here, it's gone. Oh, it's dude. Gone. No, you do realize that could be the Achilles heel that undoes the entire global economy. What you just, I, I understand that. It's bad. Oh my God. It's really bad. And and let's add to that. Let's just have fun. I, I don't want to call it fun because I'm weeping, you know, you know, as I say that. But you could toss a little lighter fluid on this, couldn't you? And just say, hey, we're we're forgetting about the two quadrillion or one point five quadrillion in interest rate sensitive derivatives out there. Who knows who's holding what swaps where? So here's a I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you the answer. Okay. I know that you interviewed Charles Nenner. Oh, yeah, he's great. Ask Charles Nenner how high he sees the 10-year yield going. Huh. And then ask him, when does he think we, he, we see 10% on home mortgage? Not on the, not on the 10-year, but on 10% on home mortgages. And I think Whoa. you'll be I think you'll be surprised how fast. Well, says, now oh. let me jump in here for a second, because my guy, one of my favorites, Ralph Acampora, has said for about a decade here, maybe longer on the show, I don't worry about a thing until rates get over five percent. It's just it. <laughs> right. I know, I know, I know. It's it's a non sequitur, okay? But if I'm looking at this chart here, Aaron. Warning bells are really starting to go off. Just just as a technician, not as you right. know, uh, yeah, an economic layperson or you know, a monetarist and a, a Keynesian. I mean, just from any technical perspective, it looks like we are on the cusp of a rate explosion. I am not going to steal Nenner's thunder. You have him on and you ask him because he's kind of the guru on that. And here's the problem with the yields okay. on, on the tenure. You probably don't know who Chris Carolyn is, but. Some oh, sure. Are. I've heard him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Chris Carolyn to the day called the low in the tenure on rates. Hmm. And in real time, because I subscribed to him in real time, he called it. I told one of my bond, my, one of my bond trader friends, and he said, no way. I said, damn, I'm not arguing with Chris Carolyn. What shocked everybody, and the press has talked about it, what shocked everybody is nobody had ever seen the 10-year do an about face and go vertical that fast. 
that, right? That's what got a number of banks in trouble is it didn't have a slow turn. We bottomed at like 50 bips and, you know, a year later, we're, we're cranking. Um, you get about 5%. It's just the sky is the limit. You could go, uh, let's go look at some technicals. Um, okay. We get about 5% and we're not slowing down till six half, six half, seven. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, you can, we can look at the resistance right here. I mean, it's pretty simple here. Better yeah. yet, I mean, we can always just pop on a Fibonacci, right? That's oh, well, yeah, that gets even worse. <laughs> yeah, because see, it goes six, eight, and ten yeah, percent. You you haven't done anything until ten yeah. percent. Yeah, it's almost. In fact, you could argue ten percent is baked into the cake as a retest of ten percent. And think, what would that do? I mean, just bear with me for a minute. If banks had to compete, if lenders, if mortgage borrowers, if small businesses had to compete with ten percent money. I mean, what's the price of money it comes to mind? I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? Nobody, the ICE 9, right? ICE 9, the whole system locks up. There is literally, the, the Fed is pouring money into the banks and they're laughing. I'm not lending to anyone. We're not lending to ourselves. No, we saw that in 08. I mean, yeah. we saw, I mean that's that's where... There was too much risk in the system, so nobody was gonna nobody was gonna trade with each other. Nobody was gonna loan. I mean, so I, I think the I think rates and, and this gets into Martin Armstrong. I think rates are going they're going meaningfully higher, oh, at least over the next five to ten years, at least. Okay. Again, mm -hmm. I just I told you that it was a thirty year. It really was actually a forty year cycle in bonds right 80 to 20. yeah okay so we've got at least another 10 to 15 years of upside on on rates and we haven't even discussed and we don't have to we haven't even discussed what is taking place with our deficits and our debt and the money printing and now we're now we're blowing a trillion dollars every 90 days every 90 mm -hmm. days now trillion every 90 days so there's definitely uh the writing is definitely on the wall that's why i'm saying and i'm not trying to be engaged in hype